Okay, I think I've already set the stage a bit for this, and I, I will review it, but let me just remind you that Paul currently in the, in the book of Galatians is, is proving that he did not receive the gospel that he is preaching from the apostles in Jerusalem. He didn't receive it from any man, but he received it by a direct revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what he is arguing in this particular place. And again, it appears the Judaizers were saying that Paul had received his gospel from the apostles in Jerusalem and that he had distorted it. That Paul is wrong, they are right, and Paul is arguing, no, okay, he's not wrong, he received it from Christ. And we're going to see this morning that as he goes to Jerusalem, in order to compare his gospel with theirs, he finds that it's exactly the same gospel that they were preaching, again, to argue against the, the Judaizers. And there's also this interesting um, place where he rebukes Peter for, for hypocrisy. He's, he's actually falling into the Judaizer snare on that particular occasion, and the fact that he rebukes Peter, and Peter has really nothing to say in reply, shows again that Paul is, Paul is right, and Peter was wrong, and that Paul's gospel is, is the right gospel. All right, let me read the text, the passage we're looking at, Galatians 2, verses uh, 1 through 14. Again, heavily biographical, so expect to get a little bit of that as we're going through this. Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem after the three years. Remember, he was converted three years later, went to Jerusalem. Now it's 14 years later with Barnabas taking Titus along also. It was because of a revelation that I went up, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. Now, we're going to look at that. That's very important. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. <laughs> well. Those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised, effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who were reputed to be pillars gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was also eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came... He began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews. Now, that, that the argument is going to continue, but I just wanted to, to make one point from this uh, this morning. I think his argument that follows is, is also a very important argument. All right. Well, let's get a running start, shall we? So Paul is writing to the Galatian churches again to warn them of the consequences of abandoning the gospel of God's free grace that is received through faith alone, by the way, the gospel that Luther rediscovered by God's grace, at the time of the Reformation, for the so-called gospel, and we're going to use that term loosely, of the Judaizers, 
which Paul tells us is really not a gospel, but a, tr a distortion of the true gospel because it adds works, our works, to the finished work of Christ for justification. You know, works, have, they have their place in the Christian life, but it's works of thankfulness for mercies received, not working in order to save ourselves. That's the part, that's the issue, okay, that, that's here. They're saying that you needed to add the right of circumcision, and you needed to keep the Mosaic traditions in order to be saved. Now, Paul says anybody who believes that will be destroyed by that because you've fallen from grace, you've been severed from Christ. You know, that is actually very similar to the gospel. I'll again use that term loosely that the Roman church held in Luther's day, the one he was responding against, and the one they continue to embrace today. They believe you need to trust in Jesus. You need faith in Him. At least you need to believe the facts, but you also need the sacraments, particularly penance, and you need to submit to the Pope. Otherwise, you can't be saved. Now, Luther could not find peace through that gospel, and the reason he couldn't is because it isn't the gospel. It's not the true gospel. It's a false gospel. Now, neither would the Galatians find peace through it. But it's what Paul is arguing. And nor will we. You know, we need to trust in Christ and Him alone because that is the true gospel. Now, Paul begins, you know, he's, as he tries to make his point, he began his letter by establishing his apostolic credentials. Why, why should they listen to Paul rather than these Judaizers? Remember, the Judaizers claimed that they were preaching the same gospel as the apostles in Jerusalem. They also claimed that Paul received his gospel from the same source, but now was distorting it. Well, Paul, as I've said, is going through a series of arguments uh, to disprove that, to refute it. The first two we saw last week. First of all, he, he said he received his gospel directly from Christ and not from the apostles. Chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. And this is the main point. For I would have you know, brethren, the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, to make his point, he says, after I received it, I didn't go to Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, I preached in the cities and towns of Syria and Arabia. And by the way, Arabia is not some faraway place, but it was parallel to where Syria was for three years, three whole years before he went up to Jerusalem for the first time. And there he merely became acquainted with Peter and with James. He didn't even confer notes at that time, he was saying. And since Paul was the only witness to that particular sequence of events, he does the only thing he can do in order to verify what he was saying was true, he calls on God to bear witness to what he says. He swears an oath that these things were true. And you know, a good Jew would not swear an oath unless he was dead serious about the things that he was swearing. And by the way, we are Jews in the Lord Jesus Christ, aren't we? And so we need to be careful as well. All right. So his first argument was he received this gospel from Christ directly and didn't even see any of the apostles for three years. But secondly, he encountered, he argued that his encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ was when Jesus gave him this gospel. And the proof of that encounter was the radical change in his life. Remember what, what he was doing before Jesus met him. He was on his way to Damascus to try to destroy the disciples who were there. He wanted to destroy the church of Christ. But after he met Christ... He was bent on building that same church and preaching the very gospel that he had tried to silence. And the church, instead of, you know, cowering from him, although we can't say the church actually maybe cowered, but they certainly wouldn't look forward to seeing him, they were glorifying God because of him. And the point is that Christ changes our hearts, doesn't he? But he does it through the gospel. And he only does it through the true gospel. False gospels will not change your life. They might change your behavior, but they can't change your heart. Now, this morning, Paul gives us two more arguments to authenticate his apostolic credentials and his gospel. The first one is that when he finally compares his gospel, the one he received from Christ, 
to that held by the Jerusalem apostles, he discovered it was the same. Well, not surprisingly. Maybe it was surprising to Paul because of the Judaizers. Maybe he was thinking, actually, I think the implication was he was thinking that maybe they had something different. But when he compared it, they were the same. And then secondly, when he reproves Peter for his compromise, and that compromise that Peter makes is the very one the Judaizers are <laughs> proclaiming, Peter did not fight against him, but he received that rebuke. We have no evidence that Peter ever fought against him or argued against him, but he was humbled by it. He was being a hypocrite. Okay, so let's look at these two. First of all, we see <clears throat> that when Paul finally had the opportunity to compare his gospel with that which was held by the Jerusalem apostles, he found they were the same. Now, he tells us in verse 1, it wasn't for 14 years that he went again to Jerusalem, and this time he took with him Barnabas and Titus. And the question I would ask of this text, which I'm sure you have at some point as you've read this, is what's the event? And there's some debate about this, but this likely appears to be the time when he was sent from the Antioch church because that's where he is at this particular time. That's where we left him because of the issues caused by the Judaizers. Now, as I've said, last, last week we saw that uh, we left Peter, excuse me, Paul, in Antioch. After his first visit to Jerusalem, he said he went to Syria and Cilicia. Uh, Cilicia is where Tarsus is. Tarsus is his hometown. And he went there to do, not surprisingly, preach the gospel, try to lead as many people as he could to faith in Christ, even those from among his, his household. We see in the book of Acts that from there, Barnabas, um, when he saw what the Lord was doing in Antioch, the great work that was going on, he, he went to Tarsus looking for, for Paul, right? Saul at the time, um, and brought him to Antioch. And we know that from there, the first missionary journey began, and it also ended and that took place somewhere around 47 A.D. I think it's interesting to note when these different events took place. Okay, so that took place around 47 A.D., the first missionary journey. But we read in Acts 15, verse 1, that sometime after that first missionary journey, about two to three years later, that some men came down from Judea to Antioch and began, preaching the, to, uh, began teaching the brethren Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, who do you suppose these people were? Okay. Well, these are the Judaizers, right? The ones that Paul is condemning in, in his letter to the Galatians. If anyone preaches to you a gospel other than the one you receive from us, even if we do that, he is to be accursed. Okay. So, he's condemning this preaching. So these, these are the Judaizers coming to Antioch, and he speaks of that event in verse 4 of our passage. It was because of the false brethren, secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. Now, that is his reason for going to Jerusalem to submit his gospel. It's because the Judaizers had come to Antioch, and that's exactly what Luke is telling us in Luke 15. And I want you to notice that Paul, again, calls them not brethren. These are not brothers in Christ. These are false brethren. He does not consider anyone who holds to that gospel to be saved. No one can trust in their works and be saved. Now, after they arrived, a debate ensued. And when they couldn't resolve the issue, they decided to take it back to Jerusalem. Now, it's not that the Antioch church was not convinced. It's not that Paul was not convinced, but they, they brought it there for a couple of reasons, okay? And by the way, Paul mentions that in verse 5 of our passage, but we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. When they came there, Paul did not accept what they had to say. The Antioch church was not sending these delegates to Jerusalem because they doubted what was the truth? They did this because they wanted to settle the issue, and perhaps they were concerned. What was going on in Jerusalem? Why are all these people coming from Judea hold this particular doctrine? Uh, 
Well, we find that that was a very real problem in that transitional period as Jews were, you know, coming into the new covenant, as Gentiles were coming in. There were all these questions that were being asked and questions about circumcision, questions about the old covenant were, were being raised. And so they wanted to settle the issue. What is the relationship between these two things? And so we read in Acts 15 too, and when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Now, let me say that the, seeing this, what Paul is talking about in Galatians 2 as the Acts 15 Jerusalem Council fits very neatly into the time frames. Okay, so here, here's a few time frames for you. Paul was converted in 33 A.D., okay, and that's, um, you might be surprised to, to hear this, but that's six years, okay, after Jesus was crucified, okay? So time, time goes on, and in, in, you know, in the Scriptures, and sometimes you don't get those time markers, but here's, okay, six years has elapsed, but it's 33 A.D., Paul is converted. He makes his first trip to Jerusalem, he says, three years later, and that means that he made his first trip in 36 A.D., but then 14 years later, he again goes to Jerusalem, and that would make the, the time then 50 A.D., 50 A.D. Well, why is that important? Because New Testament scholarship believes the Jerusalem Council took place around 50 A.D. So it fits the time frame, okay? It, it fits the circumstances. It even fits the participants. I want you to notice that Luke and Paul agree on who it was that went up. Luke says that Paul and Barnabas and some others went up to Jerusalem. Paul writes in Galatians 2.1, after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. And not just Titus. Titus is just one of those others from Antioch. Now, another interesting thing to note is the reason why Paul says he went there, okay? He says in our passage that he went up because of a revelation, okay? Jesus gave him a revelation. He told him he wanted him to go up. Now, we know that the Antioch church took this issue to Jerusalem because these men had come from Judea. They wanted to know what's going on in Judea. But they also knew that Jerusalem was the center of Jewish Christianity. And if this is what the apostles were teaching, this is where it needed to be settled once and for all. But the Lord also had a purpose for Paul going up there. It's why he wanted Paul to go, why he said, you know, to him in a revelation, this is my will because I want you to be confirmed that the gospel that you are preaching is the true gospel that comes from me and not the distorted gospel of the Judaizers. Rather, the Lord Jesus wanted him to expose that gospel. So he sent him there to compare his gospel with that of the, um, the apostles. Now, Paul says he did it first in private, which is interesting. He didn't want to create a public stir if there was no need. He wanted to know if the apostles were on his side, perhaps, or if he was going to find himself arguing against them. He says he went to those of reputation, to the 11 apostles. And then he says something that it doesn't make sense because it almost sounds like Paul was wondering whether he had the truth, but he really never wavered. He says, for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. I can't tell you how many times I read that and thought Paul was doubting his gospel. You know, because of all this that was going on, maybe he was mistaken, so he had to confirm it by going to Jerusalem. But that's not at all what it means, okay? Paul may appear to be questioning his gospel, but that's not what he's doing. What he means is he, he went up there to see if the apostles were holding to the gospel of the Judaizers because if they were doing that, that would undermine his ministry, Okay, so I hope you can see the difference here, okay? And the point is that if they're preaching a different gospel, then Paul is saying they're working against me. Then everything that I have done, everything I'm doing, and everything I will do is going to be undermined by their false gospel that they're preaching in Jerusalem. 
He knew that he was right, but if that was their position, that would make his work even harder. Okay, so one commentator writes this. While the Jerusalem leaders were not the source of Paul's authority, his efforts to preach the gospel among the Gentiles would have been hindered if these influential men had opposed him. So that was his fear, was that they might be in opposition to him, not that what he believed might not be true. Okay, I hope we see the difference between those two things. But when he went up and spoke with them, his point is he found out that they had the same gospel. And I, I imagine that would have been somewhat of a relief from him. And he writes, not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. In other words, the Jerusalem apostles did not say, look, you got a Gentile with you there? Says he's a Christian? <laughs> well, look, he's got to be circumcised in order to be saved. No, that's not what they're saying. See, Titus didn't, wasn't compelled, and he wasn't compelled to become a Jew. And that's important. You know, this morning, uh, Donna was listening to one of the uh, Ligonier videos, and he was talking about, you know, Paul takes Timothy and he has him circumcised. Titus, he takes to Jerusalem, and he's not compelled to be circumcised. Why? You know, well, he says the difference is, is the difference between must and may. Okay, Timothy could be circumcised, and it was done um, as a matter of Christian liberty in order that the gospel would not be hindered when they preached to Jews because he was part, partly Jewish in his background. Titus was a full-blown Gentile. He didn't have to be circumcised. There was no must here. And that's really the difference, isn't it, um, in, in a certain way between the Old Covenant and the New when we're looking at these traditions, okay? They may be kept. Paul kept them. One may be circumcised, but not must. You don't have to in order to be saved. Okay, so the Jerusalem apostles did not believe the Gentiles needed to become Jews to be saved. They didn't believe that faith in Jesus was something you added to the Old Covenant, keeping the Old Covenant intact, but that He fulfilled it, and He replaced the Old Covenant with a new covenant, a new covenant that puts the Gentiles on an even footing with the Jews without circumcision, without their traditions, and where both are received by God through faith in Christ alone. Okay, that is the point at issue. Now, you know what, Paul says something else that is remarkable. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but he, but he also says that when he went to the apostles and he, he submitted the gospel that he had to them, that they had nothing to add to him. <laughs> he knew it all. He, he had figured it all out. Jesus, in his revealing these things to him, had given him a, you might say, a full discipleship. He writes in verse 6, but from those who are of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. And he doesn't mean by this that they were stingy and wouldn't help me with my missionary budget, you know, to go out. But, but what he was saying was that they had nothing more to add to his understanding. And that's really surprising when you think about it because the apostles were discipled for three and a half years by the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet Paul knew as much as they knew, again confirming his apostolic call coming from Christ. Okay. Now, Paul further notes that the apostles did not look down on him because he was the, the after-apostle, so to speak, you know. They didn't look at him as a second-rate apostle, which can be looked at, by the way, as an additional argument against the Judaizers. They received him as a full brother and a full partner in the ministry of the kingdom of heaven. They saw that the Lord had entrusted to him the task of preaching to the Gentiles and had blessed his work. Remember, he has one missionary journey under his belt and churches have already been planted and people are being saved. God had blessed his ministry in the same way that he had blessed Peter's ministry to the Jews. And because of this, Paul says that James and Cephas, who was Peter and John, the pillars of the church, those who were the most important men in the Jerusalem church, they extended the right hand of fellowship to him and to Barnabas 
they recognize them as co-laborers in the gospel, that they might go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. Okay, so same gospel. You've been called by Christ. God has been using you. They embrace them. We are all part of the same body of Christ. We are all doing the same work. So they're in full support of Paul. That's a very important thing against the Judaizers. And then one thing is added here. They only ask that they remember the poor. And I think by that, what they mean is the poor saints in Judea. Now, remember in Paul's ministry on more than one occasion, he took up a collection from the Gentiles for the poor saints that were in Judea because they were struggling there. And he also used this argument. Gentiles, you have shared in the blessings that were meant for the Jews. And if you've shared in their spiritual blessings, you should also be sharing your physical blessings with them so that there might be this mutual sharing and concern for one another. And I, let me just say as an aside, that's certainly what our Lord Jesus calls us to do, doesn't He? To help the poor. I think it's interesting when the crowds came out to John the Baptist and he's saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The crowds were saying, what do you mean? You know, what, what should we do? He said, the man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and he who has food is to do likewise. <laughs> that was what he said. What he meant by repentance, that was probably one of the main problems, one of the main sins they were experiencing. And the author to the Hebrews also writes this, do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So don't forget the poor. And James tells us that true religion is, is certainly that, visiting those who are destitute. And those who are destitute are generally the widows and the orphans and providing for them, making sure that they, you know, they don't go without so that they, they perish. But again, Paul, Paul's point here is the Galatians should listen to him. We should listen to him because he received his gospel directly from Christ, the only gospel the Lord uses to transform lives, the same gospel that Jesus entrusted to the apostles. So far, there is a perfect argument here. Now, the last argument, very briefly, is, is, has to do with the confrontation with Peter. Now, apparently, Peter went to Antioch to see what the Lord was doing. He heard wonderful things, and he wanted to strengthen the work there. That's great, Peter. You know, that's, that's what we should do. And he did for a while, and after he first arrived, he treated the Gentiles as equals, okay? He even ate with them which to this point, many of the Jews would not do. You know, that, that's interesting because that even refers to the believing Jews. They still had a difficult time eating with Gentiles. Now, remember that after Peter preached to Cornelius and his household, and by the way, Cornelius was a Gentile, but he was a God-fearer, which means he was like a halfway convert to Judaism. But he was still a Gentile as far as the Jews were concerned, and you shouldn't eat with a Gentile, but that's what Peter did. And later when he was giving an account of this to the apostles in Jerusalem, the other apostles, we read this in Acts 11, verses 2 through 3. When Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Boy, aren't we past that? Well, no, we're not, we're not past that. Because this is where the Lord is beginning to teach them that the, Gen uh, the Gentiles are equal with the Jews and you should receive them and eat with them and so forth. But the question that we need to ask is this. Where in the Bible does it say you cannot eat with a Gentile? As a matter of fact, you know, there are commandments in the Old Testament that say, you know, to the Jews, if you have some sojourner who's wandering through your territory, it doesn't specify whether they're Jew or Gentile. Show hospitality to them. You know, be kind to the strangers. Uh, and we're supposed to do the same thing as well, right? The Lord never actually forbade them with, you know, from eating with the Gentiles. So what, what is this really all about? Well, in the first century Judaism, no one would eat with anyone unless they considered them an equal to them. So that's the point, equality. The Jews did not consider the Gentiles to be their equals, not even believing Gentiles. So Peter was fine. I mean, he, he was on the right track. But then when some of the Jews sent from James came to Antioch, 
Peter withdrew from the Gentiles and wouldn't eat with them anymore. Barnabas withdrew from the Gentiles and the rest of the Jews who were with them also, when they saw that happening, they also withdrew. And the Judaizers likely pointed to that as proof. You see, Peter, Barnabas, the Jews, they're all on our side because they would not eat with the Gentiles until they became their equals, until they actually became Jews. Now, Paul, instead of um, accepting that, of course, turns that around in verse 14. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in the presence of all, public sin, public rebuke, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Okay, Up to this point, you were fine. Now the Judaizers are here. Now you want to please them. Okay, The Jews are here. You're beginning to act like a Jew. You were content to see the Gentiles as your equals. But now the Jews are here. You're not doing that. Okay, that, That's hypocrisy. And Paul called him out. He withstood him to his face publicly. And Peter had nothing to say in reply. And the fact that he didn't strengthen Paul's arguments against the Judaizers. Peter realized the Gentiles were his equals in Christ without becoming Jews. And the point is we are all equal in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that, that is really, again, the same point that applies to us, doesn't it? In the New Covenant, we do not have to become physical Jews in order to be saved. Okay? We don't have to be circumcised. We don't have to keep the Mosaic traditions. We may, but there's no must. We don't have to do that. Okay? Contrary to what the Roman church believes and any, any uh, so-called, what would we call them? They're cults. You know, any cult that, I mean, any so-called church that says you have to work for your salvation is a cult. Okay? All right. So any religion that claims that we need the, to add these certain things is condemned by the Lord. Contrary to Rome, I was going to say, we don't need the sacraments. All we need is Christ. All we need to do is receive what He has done and what He has done alone to be justified. Secondly, we're also not secondhand citizens, okay? We are fellow citizens with the Jews. Through the gospel, we are in every way equal with them because we are all united to the same Christ. You see, in Christ Jesus, Paul says elsewhere, there, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile. There isn't any rich or poor, bond or free. We're all one in, in Christ. That is God's gift to us, the gift of His grace in the Lord Jesus Christ, which we receive by faith. That's how we are in Christ, is by trusting Him. And we should be thankful that God has given us His Son, that God has given us the Spirit, that we might trust in His Son and be united with His Son. And we should also, for that, Worship Him. That's what the Christian life is, is a life of, you know, that responds in love and service to the Lord, love and worship to Him. So I'm going to suggest that as we prepare to come to the table now, we take just a moment, bow in silent prayer, and let's ask the Lord to give to us, grant to us a thankful heart, a worshiping heart, a serving heart, and that He might strengthen that heart as we participate in the supper and receive the help the Lord has for us here. Let's just take a few moments and pray.